Can I share a couple announcements? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> okay. The last couple weeks, the last couple weeks, y'all have heard me talk about push pay, right? Push pay, it's our new online giving platform, but it's not just, what's that? Oh, oh, great. It's not just for, um, it's not just for online giving. It also is, it can do so much more. So for those of you that are on our band platform, it's going to replace band. Oh. Hallelujah. <laughs> um, it's going to replace kids check-in. Um, it's going to replace scheduling. So uh, just as we're growing, we've noticed that some things with Planning Center, which is what we've used for check-in and giving and all that, uh, has some limitations that uh, PushPay does not have. So we are switching to PushPay. You'll, you probably got an email about that yesterday-ish. And please be following those instructions. And if you still need help after the instructions, like I do, um, you can go see Jared or Deb Beck. Jared or Deb Beck, because they're the people. I am not your person for that. So that's the way it goes. Okay, students, are y'all paying attention? Well, why not? Because Lori's selling donuts, yes. Woo! So buy some Krispy Kreme donuts. They'll be delivered on June 1st. In two weeks, all the money goes to Sunset Music Fest. There's another fest earlier in the month called Sunset Praise. We are participating in, uh, with The Well and First Church Eau Claire and Second Chance Ministries and Sunset Music Fest. It's our second annual. We also have next year scheduled. It's really great. DPP is coming in, and it's going to be fantastic, blah, blah, blah. But it costs us some money, so we're raising some money. So buy some donuts, okay, from Lori. And the, ki the bake sale, yes. Uh, so there's a bake sale out there, so buy some of that stuff too. So students... You will have service tonight, but it will not be here because we have a graduation that will be here, but because, no offense to the Dawsons, it's not cute in here. The graduation party is going to be at our new sanctuary, and um, that's where the student service is going to be too. So. It's going to be really fun, and it's going to be awesome, and so students get there tonight, 5 o'clock. Unless you're coming to the party, that's going to start around 3. 3384 Clawson Road, Eau Claire. 3384 Clawson Road, Eau Claire. Now, your GPS might say Dwajak, but the post office and Barron County say Eau Claire, so that's what we're going with. <laughs> now, next Saturday... The students have a service day out at the new property, so y'all will be hearing about that more. Jacqueline will be leading some teams, and Evan will be leading some teams, and it'll be awesome. Now, yesterday we had one. I know there was like 30 or 40 people out there. That was awesome. We got a lot done. I have pictures to show you, but they're not behaving, sadly. So, so it'll have to be next Sunday. So you all have to come back next week to see the pictures from yesterday and next Saturday. And so that's that. If you served yesterday, please stand up. I know Janae was there, Debbie Sanford was there, Faith and Kelly were there, the McNallys were there, the Slavicheks were there, Matthew, Elijah, Samantha, Tina Schlute. Thank you guys. Come on, thank you, Dexter, the Garganos. There was a lot of people out there. There's a lot to be done. And it's getting done. So thank you. It's awesome. Uh, we have another one of those scheduled June 1st. Uh, so all church service day June 1st. We have a potluck scheduled out there. No work. Just play and eat. Okay. Next Sunday, 2 p.m. So come for church. Bring some food or go grab some afterward. Go out to the new place. 2 p.m. We're going to have a potluck in the new sanctuary area. Sunday at 2 p.m. We have electricity. 
There's going to be crockpots there today. I'm like three or more. I don't remember. So we'll test the power. If you got hot food, we're going to test the power. Okay. We like to push things around here. That's what we're going to do. I think there's plenty of power in that place. Praise God. So this summer, we have leadership training scheduled. If you feel called to full-time lifestyle ministry, or if you, feel, if you just know you have a ministry call, even if it's in the marketplace, which is what? Not everybody understands what that having a regular, normal job, that's the marketplace. We want you to, we encourage you to sign up for a leadership training. It starts this summer. It'll continue into the fall. It'll be every other week this summer. We just believe that the only way to change the culture is to put some leadership skills, one of the ways, into people. And so they know how to be out there in the community leading and leading their workforces and things like that. So come to our leadership training because it's going to be great. And it doesn't cost you anything except maybe a book. So that's not bad. That's totally fair. Okay, so I'm Kara, in case y'all didn't know. I'm going to get started with today's message, finally. Oh, wait, I have something to give out. Charity, I have your baptism certificate. She got baptized a couple weeks ago. Thank you. Finally gets her certificate. I normally try to give them out on baptism day, but there's a lot been going on lately, so I apologize for that. Okay, Shane and I are the... Um, apostolic oversight of this church and ministry, right? Uh, We're the father and mother of the house and the founding leaders, right? So I just want to share that with you. And I'm going to go into that more, but I want to read several verses first from Ephesians, and I'm reading from the Passion Translation, okay? Ephesians 1, Ephesians 4, 1 through 16. I might skip a couple. This is Paul writing. As a prisoner of the Lord, I plead with you. So everybody listen, this is the word of God being spoken right now. I plead with you to walk holy in a way that is suitable to your high rank given to you in your divine calling. With tender humility and quiet patience, always demonstrate gentleness and generous love toward one another, especially toward those who may try your patience. We all have some of those in our life. Be, th- be faithful to guard the sweet harmony of the Holy Spirit among you in the bonds of peace, being one body and one spirit, as you are all called into the same glorious hope of divine destiny. Hang on. You are all called into the same glorious hope of divine destiny. Each of you have a divine destiny. Every single one of you, you may not, you may feel like I got nothing to offer. That's a lie from the pit of hell. You do because you're alive for the Lord. God is one. And so are we for we share in one faith, one baptism and one father. And he is the perfect father who leads us all works through us all and lives in us all. And he has generously given each one of us a supernatural grace according to the size of the gift of Christ. This is why he says he ascends into the heavenly heights, taking his many captured ones with him, and gifts were given to men. And gifts were given to men. Okay? I'm going to skip down to verse 11. And he, this is Jesus, he has appointed some with grace to be apostles, some with grace to be prophets, some with grace to be evangelists, and some with grace to be pastors, and some with grace to be teachers. And their calling is to nurture and prepare all the holy believers to do their own works of ministry. As they do this, they will enlarge and build up the body of Christ. Did you catch that? Their own works of ministry. Their own works of ministry. These grace ministries will function until we all attain oneness into the faith. So oneness is not sameness, okay? We're not all the same. We're not supposed to be all the same, but we can't all be one, especially you, Slava Chuck. (laughs) 
We can all be one, right? Even though we're not the same. Pumpkin spice lover. He's different. He's different. It's okay. We, we love him. So, until we all attain oneness into the faith, until we all experience the fullness of what it means to know the Son of God, and finally we become one into a perfect man with the full dimensions of spiritual maturity and fully developed into the abundance of Christ, and then our immaturity will end. And when our immaturity ends, go on, and we will then not be easily shaken by trouble, nor led astray by novel teachings or by the false doctrines of deceivers who teach clever lies. But instead, we will remain strong and always sincere in our love as we express the truth. All our direction and ministries, all our direction and ministries will flow from Christ and lead us deeper into him, the anointed head of his body, the church. For his body has been formed in his image and is closely joined together and constantly connected as one. And every member has been given divine gifts. Every member has been given divine gifts. Some members, a couple members. Every member has been given divine gifts to contribute to the growth of all. And as these gifts operate effectively throughout the whole body, we are built up and made perfect in love. That's a lot. But let's review. All of us have a divine calling. So say, I have a divine calling. calling. We share one faith. Let me tell you what denomination means. It means division. We are not supposed to be divided because we share one faith in Jesus. And I believe they have gotten oneness confused with sameness. that That is not the same word. And instead of operating as one, they've looked for same. And if somebody has a slightly different interpretation or whatever, different perspective, they don't want to be like them, and hence denominations, which means division. Many gifts, Jesus gave gifts, right? There's a lot of gifts. Jesus gave the gifts of the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. All the other gifts, which are plenty, are from the Holy Spirit. They were given for what? For our own ministry, for our part in advancing the kingdom. We all have a part in advancing the kingdom. These gifts create a mature bride, not easily succumb to the enemy's attack. So when there is what we call fivefold, when there's a fivefold gifting, ministry gifting operating in a church, it creates a mature, empowered bride, not easily succumbing to the enemy's attacks. Does that sound like a good thing? Yes, it does. So... We're all divinely gifted to advance the kingdom. We're just called to do it differently in our own oneness, but all in love. So the gifts Jesus gave are often called the fivefold, and that's how we operate here, okay? Some of you know this really deeply, and some at a surface level, and some of you probably don't know it at all. But it's one of the reasons we have multiple people preaching every week, because we do operate in a fivefold ministry. Um, and... It's occurred to me as, as I was praying for this week, because we're not really in a series, I take it for granted because we, we operate in it, but not everybody does. And so just to give you some more education around how we operate throughout the year is something that we are committing to do. So when we first heard about Five Hole Chain and I, like something clicked in our spirits, and it was years and years ago. Um, but none of the churches were talking about it. Like, like zero. And other than Bethel Church in Redding, California, there were no other churches we knew operating in it, right? And when the Lord established our fivefold team in June of 2019, we didn't have a lot to go on. We just knew it was something that the Lord was calling us to do. And then a couple of weeks later, we ran across 
this prophetic word from a prophet out of Ireland named Veronica West, and it just confirmed everything that it was, for, it was a word from 2018 we found in 2019, and she was saying that the fivefold ministry is going to return to the church because it started in the church in the apostolic age of the New Testament. So we've learned a lot, a ton, right? We haven't done it all perfectly, but we haven't done it all wrong either. There's not a lot of books written about a fivefold ministry. I did write one, actually, and it was published, believe it or not. If you want to know more about it, there's a fresh glimpse in the fivefold ministry. It's back there. You can, you can get it. Um, so here's, here's how we see it, all right? If Shelly, in the blue here, has an apple, and we're looking at the same apple, okay? My side is bruised. Her side is perfectly shiny, okay? So she's describing to me this beautiful apple, it looks like it's crispy, it's fresh, it was just picked, it's amazing, right? And I'm like, well, you're wrong. How can you possibly think it's a beautiful and amazing apple, right? And I'm not seeking to understand, which would be what? Just turning the apple. All I have to do is turn the apple to see, oh, wow, your sight is really shiny. So that perspective that she has is not wrong. But then the perspective that I have is not wrong either. Right? And it is in honoring those perspectives that the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher have when we're looking at the apple or looking at a training center program or looking at what do we do for Friday nights, what do we do for Sundays, is there anything we need to tweak or anything we need to change or anything we need to do to make sure our services are better for everybody here involved, right? Who do we need to empower? Who can we raise up to be a leader? All of those things. We're looking at this apple, and we're making sure that we turn it on every side. And what I believe part of the denomination thing has happened is they haven't turned the apple. They're just seeing the bruised side or the shiny side, and they're not turning it around to see the other perspective is correct, and it's created division. But listen, the only way it works, and I mean the only way, this would work is through honor and humility. Amen. That's the only way it works. It will not work any other way. If we cannot humble ourselves to hear from another person, if Shane and I can't do that, then we're just a one-man show and we'll just make all the decisions. But then you only have one perspective leading the way. And we can't do that because it doesn't create an equipping, unified church. And our desire is to do what Jesus said, to create an equipping, unified church. How you do that is through the fivefold ministry, which means everybody has a different perspective, which we need to honor and understand and figure out how to implement. Does that make sense? Okay. And I want to repeat, just because a perspective isn't the same as yours does not mean it's wrong. So some people call the fivefold offices, some people call them anointings, some people call them giftings. I'm not really going to argue any of that because it's not worth my time or yours. But I want to share with you some differences in what you'll find in, in people that have these giftings, right? People that are apostolic are catalyzers. They are builders. They are visionaries. They can gather crowds, empower people, and present opportunities they work hard, and they push hard, and they run fast. They're standard setters, mothers and fathers, and presence prioritizers. Now, then we have the prophet. Well, and we'll talk about some negatives too, right? The prophets, now remember John the Baptist. Where was he living? In the wilderness. What was he eating? A little bit eccentric, right? So prophets are generally a little eccentric. They walk to their, their own beat. Right? But they have an access to the Lord's voice in unique ways that you'll find other people won't. Right? Um, they'll call out the good and they'll call out the wrong. Now, something that's happened in the prophetic kind of world is, you know, if you read the Old Testament, which is still relevant, by the way, if you read the Old Testament, they were calling out the wrong, which was sin a lot. And then somehow along the way, the prophetic movement kind of stopped doing that. But really, they're supposed to call out what's going on that is wrong and that is sin. And, and that's okay. It might not be comfortable, 
but it's okay. Because if there were more of that happening over the last 50 years in our nation, we'd probably be in a different place than we are right now. Amen. Prophets see color, while a teacher will see black and white. Now evangelists, they're not looking for a deep relationship with you. They are amazing people. But to be honest, they just want to find out, are you saved? Great, I'm moving on. Are you saved? Great, I'm moving on. Are you saved? You're not saved? Let me, let me bring it to Jesus, right? They bring him to Jesus, they're moving on. Bring him to Jesus, they're moving on. Bring, because their heart's desire, their driving force is to share the love of Jesus and the gospel with people. That is what they do. They, it's, they're born into it, right? It's just inside of them. They just can't help sharing. I was having lunch with somebody a couple years ago, and they were like, I just want to tell people about Jesus. I was like, oh, you're an evangelist, right? Um. So they have deep relationships, it's just not with every single person, right? That's where the pastor comes in. The pastors, the people with the pastoral heart and the pastoral gifting, they love to sit with you. And they want to hear your story. And they want to love on you. And they want to bring you to emotional healing. And they just want to make sure everything's okay, right? They just, that's just their gifting. And it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. And they're needed and they're necessary. Right? They have deep, deep mercy gifts. They're calming influences in a storm while the apostolic tend to bring the fire. Okay? They're great. What'd you say? Might seem like a storm. Might seem like a storm. That's where the pastor comes in and calms things down. It's okay. Teachers are pretty black and white. This is what the word of God says. Don't do that. Don't do this. Do that. Do this. Right? They're, they don't have a whole lot of mercy either. They're very detail-oriented. You can tell if you're speaking to a teacher because they're telling you every little detail about this thing. <laughs> Brian Anderson, Mr. Beach, in six different ways, Jared. You know, they're telling you all this stuff, and you're like, man, I just, can you just make it work? <laughs> right? I just want it to work. I don't know anything else. Scotty, teacher. Obviously, Mark, pastoral heart, come on. So, uh, they're not mercy-driven. Teachers are truth-driven. They're detail-oriented. They get a little lost among the details, but there is a, there's a difference between there's immature apostles, right? And they're going to be pushing too hard, and they're going to take on too much. Yeah. Immature prophets will speak through their wounds, right? An, Im an immature evangelist will always feel like they're not doing enough. An immature pastor can enable sin because they won't call it out. They'll just be like, oh, it's so, you know, because they just want to love you. But an immature teacher can't flow with the Holy Spirit. They want to cap it. They want to shut it down because it's unknown. You don't know where he's going to go next. So they want to, they're not comfortable in that. So they'll, they'll shut it down. But generally, the apostles will call out people's destinies. The prophets will give hope. The evangelists bring in the lost. The pastors care for the people. And the teachers educate them in the word. All together, the fivefold ministry is a complete rep representation of Jesus. Okay? Jesus was the only man to ever walk the earth. I don't care what anybody tells you. To have all five giftings in one person, in one body. I am not Jesus. I do not have all five giftings. Okay? Now... We know, Josh. <laughs> now, if there's somebody walking down the street and nobody else is around that knows Jesus, and that person, is, he'll, he'll, he'll give me the words to be an evangelist that day, but it'll be with an apostolic bend, okay? But here is how you can tell where Jesus, who he was when. Jesus was the apostle when he drove out the money changers with the whip. He was the prophet when he said the temple would be destroyed but raised again three days later. He was the evangelist when he multiplied the two loaves and five fish. He was the pastor when he said, let the little children come. And he was the teacher when he preached the Sermon on the Mount. Does that make sense? Yeah. Every office, every seat, every anointing, gifting, whatever, has strengths and weaknesses. Apostles can be too driven, prophets too heavenly minded, evangelists feel like, I, said, I already said this, they aren't doing enough, and teachers can be too direct, and pastors can have too much mercy, which maybe seems like an oxymoron, but it's not. 
So if the Bible says these perspectives are what makes for unified equipping church, shouldn't we do what the Bible says? And so you'll hearing more and more about fivefold ministry in the ministry world, in the church world, right? And it's really awesome because it is biblical. Um, but some people still don't believe in it and they think, oh, that's not for today. But if the rest of the word is for today, then I think that's for today too. Am I right? Okay. We are not all apostles, but we all should be somewhat apostolic. This, where you are, is an apostolic hub. Apostolic hubs have big vision from the Lord. And what we're going to do is equip you and raise you up to do what the Lord has already put inside of you. One reason we empower people to preach is that it allows another perspective to flow. And I firmly believe that every single person in here hears from the Lord and every single person in here has the ability to give a message, whether it's behind a platform or it's one-on-one -on -one with a person. You hear from the Lord. If you know Jesus, if you've if asked him into your heart, he will download something to you for you to share with somebody because you're not here by accident. You're here on purpose, with a purpose. He created you a long time ago with a plan and a design, Right? And the church, sadly, Big C, has failed to really, truly empower and equip people to do what they're called to do. And in that failure, what began, and if you research, research New Testament church, it was multi-person. Many people spoke throughout the day. It was a multi-person show, but it became a one-man show. And that's never what it was supposed to be. And in that, the one-man show laced with consumerism and not activation, which is why we have this time clock Christianity where people want to come in for an hour and check it off their list for the week and be gone and not think about Jesus for another seven days. But that's not a lifestyle we're supposed to have with the Lord. He should be part of our everyday life. It's so ingrained in our being that we can't think or operate without spending some time with him every day. And the only way to get there is by spending time with them. So many churches over time became businesses and not families because there was this lack of activation and empowerment and there was a promotion of consumerism and all of that. And in that business, you know, I heard... Uh, there, uh, years ago, we, we heard of something like um, this person was not allowed to run a, a life group at their church because they were a recovering alcoholic. And I'm like, well, that's, but Jesus doesn't hold us to our past. Why are we people, why are we holding people to their past? The church should not hold people to their past. We have to hold people to their future. And because many American churches and probably throughout the world have done that, you're, you're letting people sit. They have giftings and anointings from the Lord because of what they did 20 years ago or five years ago or six months ago. That's a sin. God doesn't see our sin and mistakes, so will he hold us accountable? Yeah, he will. He's going to lead us to repentance, right? There should be joy in repentance because we know we're forgiven. We don't have to hide our sin because when we hide our sin, our flame goes out. You know, this week I had to apologize because I was really rude. I didn't seek first to understand. I was feeling frustrated about something, and I should have sought first to understand. I didn't, and I apologized. I don't need to hide it. I don't need to cover it up. I just need to take responsibility, right? Because there's freedom in that. So we need to be people that look at people for what God has created them to be and not who they were in the past. Because if we are intentional about growing into who he created us to be, we're going to be different five years from now than we are right now. I am. Just by reading the word of God every single day, I absolutely think differently than I did five years ago. That's what it does. It's a living, alive word. It changes you from the inside out. And I know it's hard because sometimes you see people being lazy or stupid or goofing off or whatever, and you just want to put the smack down on them, especially me, but, or Shane, or Lori. <laughs> but we can't do that. We have to seek first to understand, remind people of who they are, re-guide them to stay back on track, right? It's not always easy. But we have to crucify our flesh because Jesus did, didn't he? Think he wanted to get up on that cross? No, he did not. 
So we have to crucify our flesh like he did. We have to be who God created us to be, right? And we have to allow other people to be who God created them to be. So holding people to their future and not their past, obviously with repentance and, and, and responsibility, right? Accepting a responsibility. That's the big thing. If You can lead somebody in a, in a conversation that leads to repentance, but if they choose not to repent, then they are choosing to stifle themselves. And then we have to choose not to empower them. That's the only choice we're given. So what I've seen is there's a lot of teachers that have the title of pastor. They don't have a lot of mercy. They're really a teacher. But this title pastor has like overtaken the American church and it's like the big top thing. And it's really not. Because what we are supposed to do is not operate like a triangle or a pyramid. We're supposed to operate like a circle on its side right? Where we're all leading together and we're all advancing the kingdom together and we're all seeking the Lord together. We're all trying to figure out together what he has next for us. So the operation of fivefold helps to ensure that the people are cared for, trained, called, and know the voice of the Lord. It allows the church to become a real family with grandparents and aunts and uncles and cousins and kids that are all invited to partake in what the parents are setting forth to do. All are invited. The kingdom of God is a family, not a corporation. Amen. And what the Lord is doing here in this place is very unique. It, it isn't being done everywhere. And I'm not saying that we're better. We're just different. He has called us to be an apostolic hub in this region and to train and equip the family to advance the kingdom. And frankly... We don't do a lot of altar calls because evangelism should be done out there. The evangelists ought to be out there winning souls and bring them in here to get trained and raised up and loved and cared for and healed, right? Amen. It was never supposed to be the top dog of the church to lead people to Christ. Not that they can't, but you should be out there gathering people and bringing them in. In addition to training and equipping he has called us to smash the competition mentality between the church and to create unity amongst the bride, which is not an easy thing to do in different regions across this lovely state that we're in. But I know it's not anything new because I was reading Philippians the other day, and Paul was basically talking about competition mentality going on between some of the people leading the churches there. So it gave me some hope that it's nothing new. It's all been done before, but we are smashing it, right? We really are, because here's my hope and desire, is that every church in Berrien County is filled to the overflow. Because the truth is, there's not enough churches. We need to plant more churches in Berrien County, in this region, because there's not enough churches to house everybody in February. All right? We need to plant more churches. We need people to come here that want to be raised up and trained up to lead a ministry. And it doesn't have to be a thousand-seat facility. It can be 40 or 50-member church. It doesn't matter because you're reaching people for the kingdom, and you're training them up, and you're raising them up, and you're sending them out because that's what we're supposed to do. And it's time. It is time to begin standing up to culture. This new property has confirmed it to us. It's time to get busy with kingdom work and make sure everyone knows what God put into them. We have to help you make sure you know what God put into you to use for such a time as this. Get to our training center classes. Take the leadership classes. It's time. The great awakening is coming, and we will be used, and we are being used in this region to advance the kingdom. It seems incredible to me because we're so very imperfect, but I'm telling you, we are making an impact because there is another multi-church worship event happening we're not involved in. I know that's because we've catalyzed some things here and people have heard about it. I just give all the glory to God. He's the one that told us we were just crazy enough to do it. All right, that's it. Like, seriously. So... In Acts 3, there's a story of a man at the beautiful gate. This is about time, right? Everyone knew 
he was crippled, even Jesus. And I've often wondered, like, why wasn't this guy healed? Like, right away when Jesus, like, just healed him, right? Because it wasn't the right time. And the beautiful gate that's referred to is actually means right time gate. So you can read this later. Of course it means right time gate. We are right now at the right time gate. Okay? With what he's done with this property, everything, the whole community watching, wondering what's happening, where are we going, what are we doing. The whole community was watching when Jesus finally healed that man at the gate. And then later on in verse 21 of Acts 3, the time referred to there in the Greek is chronos, okay? Chronos is a period of time or a season of time that refers to restoration of all things. It really means to reconstitute something, to rebuild something from the ground up, like they're going to do with that roller rink out in Sister Lakes. They're going to rebuild it from the ground up, and God wants to rebuild us. It's a new season, a new era. There is new wine. We have to let the old school and the old wine go. We have to be made new, but it's going to take intentionality. It's going to take humility. It's going to take honor, and it's going to be crucifying your flesh to become who God created you to be because there's a whole lot of things that I want to do, but I don't do because the Lord doesn't allow me to do it. We have to choose to submit and allow it. Now, Kairos is the time referred to in verse 19 there. And in every season, which is Kronos, Kronos is a period, a season of time. In every season, there are Kairos moments. These are windows of opportunity that the Lord allows you to partake in if you choose. But they're not guaranteed because it's our choice to walk through or not. So I am saying and I am encouraging all of you, choose to step through. Choose to say yes to the opportunities that the Lord is saying, setting in front of you. Choose to walk through in obedience. Choose to choose, choose, choose yes. Because now is the time. You are here for such a time as this. You're not here by accident. You're here for such a time as this because something amazing is going to happen. This new property is a chronos season and a kairos moment for us. It is both. It is both. It is a time and window of opportunity for us to walk through in faith, believing God will provide all we need to be there because we are in our chronos season. Look at the culture around us. This is why. Amen. Amen. Look at the culture. Do you know the porn industry? makes more money than the Major League Baseball, NBA, and NFL combined? Do you think that's a problem? I think that's a problem. And I'm not judging anybody in here. If you have a, a problem in that area, I'm really not because the Lord has something better for you and we want to help you walk into freedom. But I'm telling you, that is because the church has not been doing its job. We have boys wanting to transition to girls and girls wanting to, I'm sorry, that's because the church has not been doing its job. It's not okay. God created every person with a plan and a purpose exactly the way they were supposed to be. And if that offends you, I'm sorry. But that's the truth. And I am here to deliver the truth of the word. We are in a crisis in our country. It is failing because the wrong people have been leading the churches and not empowering the people and activating them and calling out sin for sin. People clap and jump and scream for, for, for sports, for NFL, for NHL, for NBA, but they can't raise their hands in church. They can't clap for Jesus in church. They can't jump for Jesus or shout for Jesus in church, but they will in a major league baseball game. That's a problem. That is all temporary. Jesus is eternal. He's the one we're going to be living with forever. He's the one we're going to be worshiping forever. That's who we need to be shouting and celebrating. Yeah. Is it fun to go to a sports game? Yeah, I love hockey. I love hockey. But my scream for the Detroit Red Wings will not be louder than my scream for Jesus. Why did we allow it? Why did we sit back and just get comfortable? There was no fivefold. There was no fivefold. Prophets weren't honored, apostles weren't honored, just the pastors and teachers, and sometimes evangelists were. Time clock Christianity, <laughs> that's one of my favorites. Seeker friendly. The seeker friendly movement. Let's not call out sin. Let's be happy for everybody to come in. We don't want to offend anybody. 
You know the, the show Seinfeld? <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with that. Oh, yes, there is. Sorry. Not trying to hurt your feeling, but if you're living in sin, you're living in sin. The Bible's pretty clear. Are we going to follow the word of God or are we going to follow the culture? Because if the church had been really empowering and activating people, our school system would be a place I could send my kids to. But it's not. So here you're going to find people who are, I'm just going to be bold enough to share the truth. I just can't hide it anymore. The Lord's been burning it on my heart. We have to share the truth and call out sin. We have to love people. I'm not going to judge you. I'm going to love you, but I'm going to make sure you get some healing. Yeah, I'm going to make sure you try to you find out who the Lord created you to be in the first place. And I'm going to make sure you know what your gifts are so you can be activated to do what the Lord has already put inside of you to do. You're not here to just sit and warm a pew. That is a sin. So here you're going to find people that love his presence. Our Sunday morning service is different than our Friday night. Our Friday night service, if you want more of Jesus, you get to FNL. You get to FNL because we are going to go deep there. We're going to seek his presence because we love his presence. Because in his presence, he changes us. And you know, I used to think, man, if we just let Holy Spirit flow, but there are going to be some people that are just going to remain like this. That is their choice. Like I said, and, the, and that's not all. We can get saved and we can go no further. And that's only half of the work that Jesus did on the cross. He did more than provide salvation. His part is done. That's 50%. The other 50% we got to work for. We got to go after our freedom, our healing, our deliverance. Our calling, our anointing, our gifting. We have to go after that. But the only way to go after that is to stop stiff arming Jesus. Bend your elbows for the embrace. I promise you won't regret it. And here's something else you can sin and still be on fire for Jesus. Yep, you can because it's the heart. And if you fall, when you fall, if you run to Jesus and not the bottle or the computer, you will find that your flame will not run out. Don't let your flame go out. Keep it stoked. Keep it burning. Because we have to have on-fire believers right now in this world, in this culture, to start confronting it. That are not afraid. And the more time you spend with Jesus, the more bold you'll be. So I am here to say, rise up. Be set free from the bounds of this world and culture. Rise up. Be who God called you to be. Rise up. Use the authority already inside of you as a child of God. Rise up. Push back the demonic thoughts. Rise up. Humble yourselves and serve your family. Rise up. Help your neighbor. Rise up. Be the church. Rise up. Because we believe in you and we're here to help you.